right, good evening, everyone. We're going to get started with our meeting. Um, we have a fun meeting plan with some announcements from our affiliates and our parent volunteers um, and a head of school update from Taylor Stockdale and Dr. Teresa Smith. Um, and then also what I hope will be a fun and engaging conversation with our college guidance team and our guest speaker for the evening. Um, it's been a long time since I've been up here. It's a little odd, I have to admit. <laughs> I was trying to think when was the last time I had to address a big group of parents. And it was actually the school year of 2018-19 when we welcomed international families on campus for orientation at the end of August. Um, so I, my heart's like pumping really quickly because there's some excitement, obviously, from the in and out, but also just so nice to start putting faces to names and to be inside and enjoy some of these wonderful spaces that we have on campus. Um, so with that, I'm going to welcome our affiliates co-presidents on stage, um, Dr. Janelle Hastings and Gina Lee, to kind of go through the first set of announcements, and then we'll just keep the meeting running. Great. Where's Gina? Oh, okay. You want me to do this? Okay, that's Gina. <laughs> I'm Janelle. Hi, everyone. I think all of you know this is the first in-person affiliates meeting we've had in two years. And so the, the, the specialness of this evening cannot be understated. I'm so happy we're all together. And I'm so happy to see all of you here this evening. I know in our busy lives, we've got so many things going on. But thank you so much for taking the time to be with us um, for good company, good burgers, and some good conversation. Um, one of the things that I'd like to bring to your attention is that we are, you know, the school year is wrapping up quicker than we could imagine, and we are going to be seeking nominations for the executive committee of the affiliates for next year. There is a nominations committee that will be convening toward the end of February and again toward the end of March. And tomorrow, all families are going to be receiving an email inviting you to please consider throwing your name into the ring for one of the positions on our executive board. We really do welcome all families to join the Affiliates Executive Committee. And because the more brains and opinions and ideas we have, the better we are to serve our students, to serve the school, and to make this a welcoming environment for every member of the Webb family. So anyway, if you have any questions, there'll be information in that email. There'll be job descriptions. And of course, there'll be contact information um, in the email broadcast you're receiving tomorrow. And you can ask any of us questions about that. So anyway, that's it for my part. I am now very pleased to introduce our uh, second vice presidents who oversee the annual affiliates benefit, which we are having this year. Uh, Mr. Barry Oglesby, Mrs. Jennifer Oglesby, and Mrs. Linda Metz. Okay, hello everyone. So we're here to talk about the affiliates benefit this year and so we would like for you guys to all join us on April 1st at 6 p.m. Uh, for the affili affiliates benefit. Uh, this event will be in person, yay, on the Centennial Field. The theme this year for Web 100 is to think, act, lead, and give. And we're all going to speak. Hi, my name's Linda Metz, and I have a senior this year, Caroline, and a freshman, that's, um, her name's Caitlin. And um, since Ms. Jennifer just said what our theme is going to be, so basically what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna ask for fundraising for the affiliates, and what that money is going to be supporting this year is for the um, academic program enhancements, as well as the innovative teaching tools. Um, and since this is the year of unbounded uh, trips that the kids will be going on, the students will be going on this year, those are some of the things that your donations will support. Um, stuff like the unbounded trips, um, paleontology programs, um, college, the, the um, Claremont Colleges programs that these students can be a part of. So we're looking for the donations this year and we're also looking for you to come out and support the school and be in person and uh, meet up with everybody since we haven't been able to be face to face in a long time. 
And also I have to plug tomorrow the girls for um, Vivian Webb Soccer are playing in their semifinals for CIF. Woohoo! Go girls soccer team. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Barry Oglesby. Uh, I have one junior here, uh, Brian class of 2023. Um, it's just great to be here, first of all, uh, back on campus. Uh, this is um, one of my first web affiliates events. Um, I was actually just talking to one of the parents uh, um, earlier about um, this is our first time seeing each other since the first freshman, I'm um, sorry, parent weekend orientation. I'm just seeing it right now. Both of our kids are juniors, so uh, great to be here. But um, like um, as I just said, the affiliates um, benefits um, event is going to be on, on um, April 1st. Um, sponsor the event, purchase your tickets, um, come enjoy. It's it's, it's going to be a really great cause. And also, um, Janelle was talking about you know um, volunteers just for serving on the affiliates. Uh, we, uh, we we were pr um, approached by Janelle last summer, you know, about purchase, uh, participating on the affiliates, and we didn't know you know a lot about what it you know really entailed, um, what we had to do. Um, but we were just excited just to help. And you know, this has been one of the best experiences. Just you know, getting to know a lot of the parents, actually, what Web does, you know, and just being able to help um, has been a great event for us. And so um, I certainly encourage all, all parents to get involved if you can. And uh, I think we're going to play the video now. Thank you. What you didn't see was Jennifer and Linda and I dancing backstage. Um, I'd like to take a minute also to invite Jenny Kong to come to the stage to give us an update about the ALF Museum. Jenny, my old friend, come on up. Good evening. Um, I just have a few updates for the museum. Um, tomorrow, please tune, tune in tomorrow at the ALF Museum's YouTube channel at 6.30 p.m. Uh, for our, our Moments of Time speaker series. It's titled, My High School Has a Museum. And um, the first one actually is the featuring the life of a Peckley Scholar student. Gabe Santos, the museum's collections manager and our outreach coordinator, will host a roundtable discussion uh, with a current seniors in the advanced paleontology program. So um, remember to register online and you can find the link on the ALF Museum website. Um, I'm excited to share that the ALF Museum is now open to, um, for in-person tours. The visit, I think the visiting hours are Wednesday to Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and you can um, uh, register online and I think you can reserve um, the tickets online. Um, the museum will resume its discovery days, uh, the first one being March 12th. Uh, discovery days take place on Saturdays from 1 to 4 p.m. in the afternoons. Please visit the museum website for more details. Discovery days um, is a great, great uh, time to spend at the museum to know more, more of what's happening at the museum. And it's a great way to connect with um, student researchers, the museum staff, and just know what's taking place at the uh, museum. Um, the other thing is Friday, this Friday the 25th, is the deadline for sophomores to sign up for the PECRI trip. So I think the sophomores have the registration in their um, inbox, um, but yes, Friday is the deadline. Thank you.
Thank you, Jenny. It is now my real pleasure to invite to the stage our head of school, Mr. Taylor Stockdale, and our associate head of school, Dr. Teresa Smith, for an update on the campuses. All right. Good evening. Here we are in person. How great is this, huh? Gosh. Dr. Smith is here. We weren't dancing behind the, the screen here, but um, Dr. Smith and I were reflecting, I think it was March 12th of 2020, mm -hmm. standing here and having to tell the 2020 that we were going to have to leave campus for a little while, but we'd probably be back by the, the end of spring break that year. We had it wrong by a little bit. But uh, anyway, uh, in all seriousness, it's great to, it's just so great to be back. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of words. First of all, I hope you had a really nice, uh, relaxing February break. Um, it's so great to see uh, everyone back a little bit more refreshed. It was a very busy early part of, uh, of the year with uh, January was really hectic with Omicron, of course, and everything else going on. Case rates, as you know, are going down, and we're just going to keep knocking on wood there, um, which has been great. And um, as, as a reminder, we have been, you know, of course, uh, working with our medical advisory board uh, throughout this entire passage of time. We meet every Saturday, and so everything we've been doing has been has been uh, at the direction of some pretty incredible doctors uh, in the region that have been advising us every step of the way. And um, as the numbers have come down, of course, we're starting to really kind of open back up our regular flow of web, which is really kind of th where the magic happens, the in-between places, the in-person interactions, the human interactions. Um, it was wonderful to see today, of course, our first indoor chapel, uh, Caroline Metz did an amazing job of kicking things off. And uh, it was just wonderful. It was, it was pretty emotional, actually, just to see everyone back and, you know, just, just to see that, that wonderful tradition it's, it's been outside, we've been doing it, we've been making do, but it wasn't quite the same. So anyway, that was great. Of course, class meetings and assemblies, we're gonna start to open up as well inside. Um, we're gonna allow the boarders to visit each other's dorm rooms and really resume our regular calendar in many ways. We're gonna start having our community dinners again, which is an important way to, to bond as a community. For the boarding students, we're gonna start outside um, in the, um, under the centennial tent and then we're going to move indoors uh, next next month which is great uh, and then some other really exciting things uh, Carol, um, Mrs. Metz uh, mentioned the CIF Vivian Webb soccer game tomorrow night and just to give you a reference point I, this is my 34th year here so I've been here a while I've we've only had two CIF champions in that entire time okay so this is a really big deal We've only had three total in our school history, and we've only made it to the finals, I think, three or four times beyond that. Of course, the girls' soccer did in 2016. But it, the point is, this is really rare, and it's really exciting. And no matter what they do, it's awesome. Like, there's no pressure. But it's awesome that they're at this level, and they're playing in this amazing arena. Uh, they're, they're really an incredible team. I've had the pleasure of seeing them a couple of times, which has been great. Um, and then, of course, um, we're going to have our Unbounded Days uh, next week, which is really kind of a hallmark program for us. Uh, Dr. Susie Lindsley has been working really hard with our faculty on that. Your students are just going to get these incredible um, experiential learning, applied learning, exciting moments uh, where they can kind of get off campus or even be on campus and do something that's really passionate for them. And so uh, Dr. Smith was the architect of this wonderful program many years ago, and, and it's just wonderful to see how um, it's taking off, so that's that's great. On the alumni side, just to let you know, it's it's most of you, except for Janelle, of course, as an alumna. Um, most of you are not alumni, but the alumni body is incredibly engaged right now. We just had a, a great alumni council meeting last weekend, and it was a reminder to me uh, the fact that you know, don't forget. I mean, this this is this is the uh, this is a family for a lifetime. Like this isn't just three or four years for your kids they're gonna be a part of this place for the rest of their lives. And I'm always amazed at how many people come back and serve web and just you know have reunions and have regional events and come back to campus. So it's, it's just something to keep in mind. And parents as well, you're always, you're always a part of this place and you're a huge part of it. Uh, and then on the other side, we have our uh, board of trustees. We're gonna be having a retreat in uh, March and we're really gonna be talking about 
uh, strategically our direction over the next uh, two to five to ten to more years. Uh, the Board of Trustees is really there to steward the institution for the long term. And so we're going to be kind of, you know, it'll be a great chance to come back and sort of reflect a bit on our current strategic uh, goals and to also just envision web in the future. And uh, some exciting plans are afoot, and I will be back to back in touch with you on some of those, but, but I wanted to be sure you knew they are also hard at work. And so with that, I will turn it over. Um, uh, Gil, great to see you. I don't know, do you, remember, do you remember me? I sure do. So my son looked at University of Richmond, and you were the first college that we looked at. And I was nervous. My son was about to faint, you know. And then he walked out of there and said, are all the deans that nice? And I'm like, probably not, but that was really cool. I'm glad you got off to the right foot. So anyway. <laughs> You're super nice, though. So anyway, great to see you back here. Uh, anyway, Dr. Smith is here to offer some reflections, and thank you again. It's great to see you. Good evening. It's so exciting to be here with you. Um, I just wanted to just say, I guess, a couple things about some of the events that have happened um, recently. You know, hopefully you had a great conversation with your student's advisor um, in the student-led conferences. Um, exciting to see kind of the um, students take control of those events. And uh, if you didn't have that conference, check your email, uh, reach out to your student's advisor. But, um, you know, it's a, just remember, remembering all of the different ways that our kids have support here. Um, and that's something that we've been really watching a lot, right, because of the pandemic and just really wanting to make sure that the, the mental health and uh, well-being of the students is, is at the forefront of what we're thinking about. Um, and as you know, we've been working with Authentic Connections, which is a, a group that we've been working with to conduct surveys just to kind of monitor. Um, one of our last meetings was a presentation about some of that information. Um, but it's one of the things we've learned from that um, process is that the quality of relationships in a student's life, right, whether on campus or at home, is really the greatest uh, indicator of their ability to be resilient. And so one of the things we also want to do is make sure that we're taking care of our parents. Um, so Authentic Connections has been running support circles for partner schools. We've had faculty and staff participate in those. And we also um, are connecting you tonight in the packet is information if you're interested in joining one of those as a parent, okay? So um, information in there. And if you have questions, um, I'm happy to answer about how those work. Um, I also share Taylor's incredible excitement about being in chapel today. I was, you know, embarrassing myself at dinner, showing everyone my bird's eye view picture that I took. Um, but it really was very emotional and exciting. So um, a lot of the learning that happens at boarding school uh, for day students and boarding students happens in those spaces, um, not just in the classroom. And so um, we've been missing those conversations and are so excited to have those spaces again. Um, I was really uh, excited on Sunday to be walking around and our alumni office hosted this just incredible event for our junior class. Some of you might have been there and, and uh, heard about it um, or heard about it at home from your kids, but we had um, alums in the fields of marketing, digital entertainment, medicine, startups, and students were really engaged in the sessions. And to be honest, I was thinking, you know, how are they going to do? We haven't really had something like this in a while. And of course, they like showed up dressed up. They were ready to ask questions. They were like connecting on LinkedIn with the alumni. So um, it was a really great event. And I just echo Taylor's sentiment that this is a, a lifetime community that they're joining. All right. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to our college guidance team, Hector Martinez. Uh, and Anthony Shin, and of course, the amazing guest speaker, Gil Vill uh, Villanueva. Um, Gil serves at the University of Richmond as the Associate Vice President and Dean of Admission, and I think has been in college admission for like 25 years, maybe? 30. 30, okay. Um, working at Bucknell, Harvey Mudd, Brandeis, before joining Richmond in 2009. Um, and I'm really excited that you're here. So welcome. Come on up, you guys. Yeah, that's a little bit less enthusiastic. Come on, I'd like a really good round. Thank you. All right. Are you guys mics on? Yes. <laughs> Could be All dangerous. Right. Uh, hi, everybody. 
Uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, so I'm Anthony Shin in the College Guidance Office. This is an exciting panel uh, that I have wanted to do for a while. Um, we have more than 50 years of admissions experience <laughs> sitting in front of you. And I always thought it would be so interesting to hear from our admissions professionals when they actually go through the process as parents, right? For me, it was kind of cathartic, right? My story, I came here, I was a student at Webb, I was one of Mr. Martinez's um, students, went through the process, and then I had the kind of crazy but really awesome privilege of helping his students go through that process, right? And it was kind of cathartic because I was like, ha, 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 ha. You get to see what this is like flipped around a little bit, right? Um, but I really thought I would, uh, it, it'd be really interesting to kind of see how they, uh, uh, you know, having a, a, a few years to kind of reflect now and, and their, their children are now grown and at various colleges or have graduated from colleges um, and to see sort of how they, how they remember things and give you all some really practical advice about uh, going through it because like the blurb says, even professionals need help sometimes, right? So, uh, Ms. Martinez, Gil, do you guys want to take a little time to introduce yourselves and more about like how you know your 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 kids and your parent in, uh, in the process? Yeah, <laughs> you want to go? Up to you. You go ahead. Go ahead. We're so polite. So, uh, so long story short, my wife worked at three highly selective schools as an admission officer. I've worked at four highly selective schools as an admission officer. And we knew, we knew everything. <laughs> no problem, right? No problem, we have this. You know, we're up to date with all the current trends. She's an educator, I'm an educator. I'm, again, I'm in this business. And thank goodness, thank goodness, you guys, that my wife won. She convinced me that it's our children are worth the investment to send them to an independent school, to a private school in Richmond, Virginia, where not only will they be spoiled, right, for so many years, but they have or will have superior college guidance. Because it meant, and she knew this, that we didn't have to be the college counselor for our children. If they had gone to the schools the, the other schools in the area. So thankfully, again, that my wife is bright and I married well and I married up <laughs> because it would have been a mess. It would have been a mess because my son is fiercely independent. If I tell him that the sky is red, he's going to say it's blue, right? And then our daughter on the other end, she's the introvert. And she's, again, she's, she's very good about taking instruction. But at the same time, she's risk averse. So thankfully that they had these wonderful counselors who served as guideposts throughout the entire time that they were in high school. So for that, I'm very grateful. And they didn't pay me to say this. You guys are awesome for sending your children here because clearly this is one of the best schools in the United States. In fact, anywhere that you're gonna find because look at all this, right? I'm a public school kid. I'm a low income immigrant. And I went to a public school, and let me tell you, a paleontology trip, research, <laughs> what, what is that, right? So I think it's awesome stuff. My son just finished from college, so he's you know, out there doing good work. My daughter is a first year college student at a school in, I'll say in downtown LA, fight on. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, before I tell you about my own, my own family, my own kids, I admitted this guy to college. Uh, so for those of you that don't know that, literally my first job, my first year in admissions, uh, I had uh, a chance to interview Gil as a high school kid who was being recruited in our football program down at Pomona Pitzer. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember being so excited to meet him, and at the end, I ran over to uh, my boss at the time, the dean of admissions, and said to him, we gotta admit this kid, he's, he's incredible, he's great. And I remember my boss saying, that's great, Hector, let's wait for Gil to apply, and you know, maybe we, <laughs> we can admit him after that. So, 
fast forward, uh, you know, we, we have lots of parallels. Uh, two kids each. My two boys both went to Webb, uh, and they're, they're proud Webb alum. Uh, and our, um, my oldest uh, graduated from college two years ago. Uh, as the pandemic was beginning, he was, he was graduating. Uh, and then my youngest is a junior down, down the hill uh, at, uh, at the Claremonts at Pitzer College. Um, and like Gil, uh, I think, uh, you know, it's amazing. I, I half joke that in my job, in my profession, and what I do uh, for the last 35 years, um, when I say something, people listen, and people tend to do what I say, uh, especially students. Uh, in my house, nobody listens to me, <laughs> and nobody <laughs> took my advice, and both my sons uh, were like, literally from the very beginning said to me, we are not, you are not our college counselor. Mr. Shin's our college counselor. We'll talk to him. If you have an issue, talk to Mr. Shin. Uh, <laughs> and I remember sending secret texts to Mr. Shin about my own children because there were many moments when, when uh, I was frustrated in the process watching them not do very much uh, and wondering <laughs> if they were ever going to get to college. Um, but amazingly enough, I, I think that, um, like Gil said, one of, the, one of the best parts, and not just because I happen to do this here at Webb, knowing that places like Webb exist and knowing that these kinds of schools uh, put tremendous resources uh, and importance to the college process uh, makes any parent feel really, really good. I'm sure many of you have friends and family that have their children at public schools or other high schools that are not like Webb, and when you watch them go through the college process, it's not a pretty picture, uh, right? And there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of uh, myths and, and, and crazy stories that, that they exchange that sometimes makes them do some, some pretty um, serious mistakes in the process. Um, and I knew at Webb, uh, with Mr. Shin, uh, under, under his guidance, that both my boys were going to, to do very well. But that didn't stop uh, me, especially me. My wife was a lot better at this, by the way. Uh, one of you needs to be better than the other, just so you know. Uh, and I was the one that needed to sit on my hands many times uh, because I was the, the nervous one that wanted to step in and, and do certain things that, that uh, I shouldn't uh, have done um, in, in thinking that, you know, somehow that would save the day and they wouldn't make mistakes. Amazingly enough, it all worked out. Uh, all four of our children ended up at great places and we're very happy with the outcomes. Uh, but it definitely was not an easy process to go through. And so what we'd like to do is just share some of those experiences through some of the questions Mr. Shin has for us um, and give you a little, a little idea of, of uh, the ups and downs of this process that, that uh, you all go through as, as parents at, at, um, you know, with, with your own children. Mostly ups. <laughs> Mostly, ups. <laughs> Mostly ups. Yeah. So, Gil and Hector, so as parents, what would you say you guys would caution other parents not to do in this admissions process? We're gonna be here all night. <laughs> <laughs> Top, then. So, for me, this is not about us, right? We're not gonna take over, again, awesome counselors, right? You, you don't have to be the heavy here, right? And what's so exciting is the idea that in the end of the day, your children are gonna find something that's gonna work out perfectly for them because in this country, our country, right? And for our international families out there, this country, there's so many wonderful colleges and universities in the nation. Right? There's 3,674, I counted, and of that, that's just here in the States alone, 2,213 are four-year colleges. Right? And then if we're thinking about some of these selective schools, this is where sometimes I want us to be careful, right? because it's about them, not about us. We want them to find a place where they're going to grow, they're going to be happy, and of course, we want good places that's going to serve them well and move them on to bigger and better places. Now, if you're thinking about selective schools, there's 271 schools in this country that admits anywhere from 25% to 50%.
there are 71 that admits anywhere from 10 to 25%, right? And then there's even fewer now that admit 10% or fewer. There's 27 of those. So we, and this is what I'm gonna say. I'm gonna end with this. Balanced list, right? And you know, to me, that was really important for us to have a balanced list for our children. And thank, thanks again for the counselors that they had. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I do think this is a process that it's very easy for us as parents um, to have a tendency to want to participate perhaps a little more than we need to. Uh, you know, this is the first big decision a young person makes. And it needs to be a really important process that is led by the student and not by the parent. It will be the first time we need to take a back seat in, in a sense. That was not natural uh, for, for me uh, as an educator and as a parent of, of two boys in my house uh, that frankly I had made almost all decisions uh, from what preschool they were gonna go to all the way through uh, where they would end up in high school. Uh, and it, when it came to the college process, partly because I thought, well, gosh, you know, these boys are gonna really benefit since I happen to do this for a living. Perhaps they might need my advice and my guidance a little bit more, and I couldn't have been more wrong because <laughs> it was a process that had to be led by them. They had to make certain decisions. They had to process certain things, um, and I had to step back a little bit and it was not it was not easy to do, but I, but I I would say that that was the most important part to acknowledge that this is something that's led by them, uh, and and they're they're in the driver's seat this time. Great. Uh, when you guys were thick in the process with with your children, um, what kept you up the most at night? What caused you the most stress? You want to go first? Sure. Um, Oh my gosh, there were so many things. But I would say one, how we were gonna pay for college, <laughs> right? Uh, literally the idea that, you know, it was gonna cost what to me felt like a million dollars a year to send each of them to, to their colleges. Uh, and knowing that we were in a situation where we weren't gonna qualify uh, for traditional need-based financial aid, uh, but we also didn't have buckets of cash sitting in our bank account uh, to just distribute to, to both boys. That, that was scary. That, you know, it, to give you an idea, with my oldest, my oldest went to school on the, in the East Coast. His school, when we put him through his four years, every semester that we paid the tuition was more than our entire down payment on our house. Every semester that he was in school there, costs more than our entire down payment on the home that we live in, right? And in my mind, we bought him eight houses. <laughs> so that kept me up at night, awesome. okay? Um, That's awesome. Yeah, I would say that that was the biggest one for me. That's the big one. How about you? So uh, uh, ditto to that, um, <laughs> you know, I keep joking to, to friends that when my daughter finishes, and she'll finish in three and a half years, <laughs> my wife and I are going to be able to take the kind of vacation where we fly to that. Instead of driving, <laughs> we're going to be flying. And it's going to be over the pond. We're going to hang out in Europe for a while, all that good stuff. But outside of, you know, how to pay for college, I think for me, my, my son is fiercely independent, as I mentioned, right? And, and there's this really lack of communication. My wife and I were convinced because of him. He wouldn't tell us what's going on. Of course, we're not gonna be snooping around and go bug his counselor about it. So we would have these things where, hey Grant, um, what's going on? What's new, right? And oh yeah, I got this. And if I have to hear I got this again, I'm gonna vomit, right? When, <laughs> when he was at that point. But one of the things that we ended up doing, and we agreed, and I think this was a good thing. In fact, the New York Times picked this up one year where, well Grant, there's a lot of moving parts in this process. And you have to be organized, right? And he loves numbers. And I thought, I know, I'm gonna get this boy, I'm gonna get him a spreadsheet, right? At the top, all the schools on the list and on the y-axis, all the different things that he's looking for. But there's a section that dad put in. 
It's called deadlines. <laughs> it kept me up at night because if I hear I got this again, I'm telling you, I, my wife will tell you, I'm like, oh my gosh, this boy's going to kill me because I don't know if he's going to meet, meet the deadlines, <laughs> right? There's a lot of deadlines. There is a lot so of anyway, I felt better, you guys, because in that spreadsheet, under each school, application deadline, deadline for scholarships, right? Notification deadline. There we go. Here's a quick story relating to deadlines. So my oldest, uh, on the due date of one of his colleges, at 4 p.m., he comes home from Webb, and he says, hey, Dad, um, I need your credit card because I have to pay my app fee for, for, for it was NYU that he was applying to at, at that time. Uh, and I said, didn't you pay that already? And he said, no, I have, I, I'm, I'm applying right now. I'm, I'm, I'm filing the app. And I said, well, today is the due date. And he's like, he's like, I know. That's why I need your credit card. <laughs> and I said, well, are you done? Like, you just need to pay the app fee? And he's like, I haven't even started. I'm going to do that right now. I lost it, right? <laughs> and I said, you know, that's like East Coast deadline. So you're three hours, you know, like you need to do the thing and you need this done before 9 p.m. And, you know, and he just looked at me like, are you kidding me? Like, I got this. Right? <laughs> so he goes upstairs. I don't hear from him for a while. And I'm fuming downstairs, right? Because I just can't believe that he's waited till the last day on the last night to file that application. Uh, and he comes down at about 8.15 p.m. And he says to me, I just want you to know that I pressed submit, it's all taken care of, and I still have 45 minutes left. <laughs> true story, true story. And that was my life with him throughout the whole process. <laughs> that was my life throughout the whole process. W was it easier for you with your second? Absolutely, it's way easier <laughs> with the second. But he was a very different kid, too, yeah. Ditto. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They learn from their older siblings. <laughs> they do. Uh, well, you know, for parents, right, I'm sure for all of you, you hear a lot of stuff, you see articles, anytime something college related, you know, you perk up a little bit. Um, you hear from friends, from family, everybody has a, an opinion about something uh, in, in, in the college process. For the both of you as admissions professionals, you hear even more than that, right? Because you know about the trends, you know about the things, you know how your own school is doing things, Gil. So how did the both of you manage that? How did you manage sort of going through other people's opinions or advice or the rumors? And can you help our families, uh, uh, you know, give them some advice on how to, how to manage through all of that? <laughs> So that, that's a great question. And one of the things that, that I, and I mean this with all due respect to all of you, right? Because we're all parents, we, we want the best for our children. But let's focus only on our children. Because it can get stressful. And the last thing you want is to ask, you know, your, your son's or daughter's friend, oh, where are you applying? Did you get in? Because that adds yet another layer to their anxiety. Let's focus on our kids, right? So as far as where to go, you know, it's like first source stuff when you're doing research. Go to the source as much as possible. Because sometimes, you know, it, the, the media will sensationalize a lot of things. And sometimes the media will focus on the most selective of schools. And all of a sudden we, we think that, oh, that is now universal. It now it applies to every school in the United States because it applies to, you know, 10 or 12 schools. Th that's not always the case. So I always want us to encourage our young people, if we're hearing something, have them do the research. Or, or the other piece is, have your young people connect with these experts, because they'll get a hold of us and ask, is this true? Is this really going on at all these schools? And we're all friends here. I mean, I, I have been reading, we did the math, I've been reading web uh, recommendations, right? which are terrific, by the way, just so you know, <laughs> for 25 years from you and 10 years from you. So I, I think we, we want to go to the source as much as possible and, and not, not listen too much to some of the noise because the noise could be not true. I couldn't agree more. 
I, I remember um, so well the, the whole idea that there was a tremendous interest in um, what my kids were doing at Webb, uh, partly because of what I did for a living at Webb. So I remember conversations that my sons would have where they would say, can you believe so-and-so uh, is trying to copy my list? Uh, and I would ask them, you know, what's that about? And they'd say, well, everybody wants to know what colleges we're applying to, and some people want to stay away from the schools we're looking at, and other kids want to do exactly the same schools we're looking at. Um, and they're sort of second-guessing each other in the process, and it was really stressing them out. Uh, and I, I really underestimated how stressful this process was to them. Um, I knew it would be stressful, but I didn't know how much anxiety, just simple things were, were triggered them. You know, I remember one time where, where I said to my oldest son, uh, I said to Will, um, hey, uh, he, he has SAT subject tests, at the time they were called SAT subject tests, they don't even have them anymore, uh, but had arrived and we had, and I had looked at the scores and I said to him, um, you know, you might want to take those again. Mm. Just as normal as I would have told anybody else at Webb. Um, and he looked at me, and I had n I've never seen that look. It was like, uh, you, I, like he literally was going to cry. And I remember thinking, what's the big deal, you, you know? And he's like, Dad, I don't think you understand how much I have to psych myself up for that. And what I really want to do is take all of these uh, SAT test prep books and burn them in the barbecue in the backyard. Uh, and, and I remember seeing that kind of stress from him and, and how much some of this stuff was, was causing that sort of uh, anxiety and feeling really bad that I just thought, well, why don't you just do that? Why don't you just take it again? Or why don't you add that other school to the list? Or why don't you do this? As if it was so simple just to do that when in fact None of it was simple, and none of it was, and everything was piling up on them in ways that um, was very visible, and, and I think it, it, it just made it really uncomfortable, and, and I, I think that that, I, I, st I still remember that, you know, that, that, that moment where you're just like, wow, I had no idea that that was going to cause that kind of stress, you know. We could start like a group, kind of like, you know, therapy. Group therapy. Yeah. <laughs> therapy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we've, we've been focused on stuff that kind of drives you crazy, but uh, let's talk about the good. You know, were there any things that you learned about your kids in this process that you were, you were sort of surprised to see? Or were there any really, really moments that, that made you proud or, or, or made you really, really happy? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it, I realized how smart they were, <laughs> right? I mean, think about, right? You're with your kid you're, their whole life, and throughout their whole life, you're watching them from, from when they're toddlers and they're learning to walk, to preschool, to kindergarten, all the way through grade school, and then you know they, they, they come to web, et cetera, and the whole time, you know you have smart kids. You know, of course, they're smart, but you really don't know how smart they really are until they're seniors in high school and they are reflecting on what they're presenting to colleges and you get a little peek at some of it. Um, my kids would not share their college essays with me to save my life, like <laughs> they just wouldn't. So I, of course, because you know where I work and you know I have access to certain things, I took a peek <laughs> after they had submitted them <laughs> and through Mr. Shin, and I read those essays and they were beautiful. And I remember just thinking, oh my God, my kids are so smart. <laughs> and they know how to write and they have beautiful vocabulary and, and it just made me feel so good and it made me feel so proud that they really had grown up and that they had figured out how to do things that on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes I would wonder, Maybe they're not so smart, you know? <laughs> uh, because, you know, at home they do some dumb things and you're just like, what? Like, but it was really nice to figure out that they were actually quite smart. I, I think ditto to that. And I, I would add resilient. Uh, you know, my daughter particularly did her college search 
during last year's big part of the pandemic, right? And to do most of her research online and not being able to you know, go to campuses and go on a, an official tour, an information session, those kind of things, was I think very, very difficult. And of course, as parents, we wanted to support her. And you know, of course, we did what we can to at least walk around an empty campus. We did that. We did that you know, for a good part of our, or whenever we can, whenever we're allowed to travel. But one of the things that I witnessed with her was you know, she, she, she's, a, she's a dancer. Um, she's in the musical, she's in the theater. And she does sports too, but the arts is really, performing arts is really her big thing. And for her to try to go ahead and continue, right, doing all this great work on stage, I finally have, finally, I'm, a, I'm like a 50-year-old man without a, a, my own man cave. I finally had one last year. And I bought a big TV, I was so happy. Big like, reclining chair, the whole bit. <laughs> so it lasted a week. And then I, I, I go up there, this is last year, excuse me. Last year, I'm like, it smells like socks in here. She converted my TV room into her dance studio <laughs> to prepare for the theater and musical season. So good for her. You know, it was a, she, she found a way to demonstrate to colleges and universities that you know, just because this pandemic is happening doesn't mean I can't do the things that I'm passionate about. So good for her. I watch TV downstairs. <laughs> um. How did the two of you personally handle the rejection and disappointment that inevitably comes in this college process? Were you cool about it? Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll begin. Yes. It was so much better with the second one. <laughs> <laughs> bad, Gil. Bad, bad, bad. <laughs> you guys, there will be you know, some things that are not going to go well because we, we, we can't control what colleges are going to do. Your sons and daughters cannot control who's applying to all these highly selective schools, right? And there are moments where I just sense that, oh my gosh, I, I wish I reacted differently when he had something less than positive to share. Mm -hmm. Because I was disappointed for him. Not because I was disappointed in him, but I was disappointed for him. But I probably should have just tempered my own reaction, because as a parent, you know, you, you get on fight or flight mode, this is my kid, right? We're going, you know, we're gonna roll up our sleeves for our children, but I, what I should have done when he had that one little setback, or it was like, it's gonna be okay. That's probably what I should have done. And then when it was my daughter, you know, cool as a cucumber. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife said, you're doing a better job. <laughs> so, so similar with me as well. With my oldest, um, you know, he, he, he was very fortunate and he got into to most of the schools he applied to, uh, but, but he did get a, a wait list from, from a particular school that, that he really wanted. And I remember exactly the moment where he looked at me for my, just, just to acknowledge that this had happened, and I know my face was saying t the total wrong thing, right? It, I was disappointed. Not in him, I was disappointed in the college. And I was mad at the college because I know that college and I know that admissions, those admissions people, and I couldn't, I was insulted, right? Because I couldn't <laughs> believe they were gonna deny my kid who had already been admitted to these other places and I knew that he was more than capable to do great things at that college. So all of that was going through my head as he was looking at me to see my reaction and he took it as, wow, you really blew it. Hmm. And it was horrible. Hmm. And I mean, it, it really, I never should have given him that face. And we still talk about it, right? Because now, of course, he's 23 years old, he's a college graduate, and we talk about that because I think he had no idea that all those thoughts were going through my head about what I was upset about, and it had nothing to do with his abilities and, and, and his worth and who he was, but I didn't know that he was seeing me as 
the dad who was just upset at him, right? And uh, so I think that, that, that was really hard. Um, but like Gil said, you know, these are our kids. Like, it, it, everything went out the window when it was my, when it was my turn as a parent. Um, you know, I, I, I reacted in ways that I tell all of you, don't do that. Mm -hmm. And I found myself doing some of those things uh, and getting upset at some of those things, um, even though I, I knew better. Um, but they, you know, they were my kids. Uh, and, and it really um, it was very, very difficult. Um, so, yeah, that, that doesn't leave you. Yeah. yeah. Let me tell you what worked, though. <laughs> so with both of them, right, we decided, and my wife and I, because we did admission work, we know and we can tell when families are cramming too many school visits in a day. <laughs> because in the end of the week, they don't want to sit together anymore. <laughs> Who knows? They're probably not talking anymore in the car, right? <laughs> so my wife and I had a pact, you know, just secretly. We're going to, when's the last time our children really wanted to hang out with us? For a week, right? So what we did was when we visit no more than two schools a day, if not just one school, and we're going to explore all that we can with that school in the morning or the afternoon, depending. But then the afternoon or the morning we're not is we're going to make vacation out of it and explore the locale, the city, wherever, the region where it's located and sample the culture, the food, all that stuff. And I think it kind of um, it loosened up our kids a little bit because they know mom and dad are, are, are educators and have high expectations of them that, oh yeah, we're, we're gonna make, you know, we're gonna make this fun. And the one thing we also did was after the visit, we didn't ask them, hey, what did you think? We didn't. We're just gonna, we're just gonna wait and see what these people say. <laughs> you know, then at some point, thank goodness my daughter is very communicative. She will just talk. That's why I think it was probably a little bit easier, you know? And she just told us. You know, this is what I think, and da 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 da. But with my son, we definitely did not want to ask that boy right away. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember with with uh, with Ben, with my younger one, um, we went down to little Thai Orchid, uh, my, my favorite Thai restaurant. It's a plug for Thai Orchid if you haven't tried it. For 30 years. Uh, for 30 <laughs> years, my favorite little Thai restaurant in the world, and we were having um, we were having lunch there, uh, and. His mom and I were, were sitting on one side of the little booth, and he's on the other side. And, and he said, hey, I have, I have news for you guys. I've, I've made a decision. And we're like, what did you decide, Ben? And he's like, I'm going to do early decision to Pitzer. And before that, way, way, way before that, my wife said to me, with Ben, zip it. <laughs> like, literally, I remember her saying that to me. With Ben, just zip it. Don't say anything about any of his colleges. Let him and Shin figure it out. It'll all be fine, but do not d tell him what you think of the schools that he's looking at and what you like and don't like and da da da. You know, we were in New York City on the college tour, and it was early in the morning. It was like today, it was freezing cold, as cold as it is right now outside. And I couldn't stand it. I was just like, and it was trash day, which is every other day in New York City. <laughs> and my wife and I are standing behind him in the tour, and there's all these kids and you know this little group of, of all of us marching through this horribly cold street in uh, you know, Greenwich Village and in front of the, the NYU campus. And I turn to my wife and I'm like, oh my god, that was a rat <laughs> that just ran in front of us. Look at all this trash. And we, at the end of the day, he bought a NYU sweatshirt, was the only place he bought a sweatshirt, and I just thought, oh my God. <laughs> and then we get to the hotel, and, I, and we were having dinner, and we we're talking about the college, and Ben's like, oh my God, didn't you love NYU? And I said, Ben, what about all the trash out there? Like, the, you know, there was trash everywhere, and those two rats that ran by. And he's like, I didn't see any trash. <laughs> and I realized, oh my God. So, and my wife gave me that look like, zip it, <laughs> right? But I was so sure for the whole time that he was gonna tell us he was gonna do early to NYU and we'd have another one going, why pay less to the other side of the world? And 
you know, finding the most expensive school in America to apply to, and we'd be, you know, doing that whole thing again, even though, we, you know, his older brother had told him, Ben, pay attention to California schools. They're really good, too. And, you know, those Claremonts that mom and dad are always talking about, they're, they're actually pretty darn good. And people out in the East Coast, are, they think it's a big deal. And, you know, and I thank God I zipped it because that day in that restaurant when Ben told us he was doing early to a school that was three miles away from our house, I had to excuse myself to go to the bathroom and cry a little bit from being so happy <laughs> that at least one of them was going to stay a little closer. Uh, so, and it's funny because you have one out here and one on the East Coast. And, you know, so it, it, it's, it's incredible. And I think it was great for my older son to be on the East Coast and it was important for him to experience that. It's a great fit for my younger son to be on the West Coast and it made sense for him to pick what he picked. I'm not sure he would have picked that if I would have intervened and told him what I thought. I think he would have found ways to talk himself into something else simply because that's what kids do with their parents. I don't know why they torture us like that, but they do that, you know, so definitely. Can I say one last, one more thing? When they get into the schools that they like and you see the happiest face that your kids have, it, there's nothing like it, you guys. <laughs> there's nothing like it. I remember when, when my daughter got into her top pick schools and it, it was just the happiest of days. And he was even happier when she got a scholarship to a couple of these things. <laughs> because like you, you all watch Napoleon Dynamite. You remember Kip? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh. So anyway, just that look when they come home with great news, you've got to celebrate with them. Whatever traditions you all have in your family, when they come home with good stuff, man, enjoy that moment. Enjoy it all. You'll, it. you'll never forget that I moment. Miss it. It's, it's I a miss great, it. great moment. I miss yeah. it. Now they just want money. <laughs> oh, oh, God, you know? Yeah. When are you getting off the ATM? <laughs> my, my older son will be on our cell phone plan for the rest of his life. I'm, I'm <laughs> Car insurance? Of it. I'm you know? Of it. Yeah. He's got a speeding ticket. Yeah. Now it's more therapeutic oh, it's for horrible. the both of you. Uh, all right, well, Gil, if you don't mind putting on your admissions hat uh, uh, for a few questions. Um, I know that a lot of our families have, this is a very awkward transition, but um, you know, it's, uh, we're in a test optional world. Yep. Richmond has been test optional just like many, many, many other colleges, most colleges uh, for the past two years. Can you tell me from, or tell us, you know, how has reading students as test optional uh, changed Richmond admissions? Sure. Uh, that's a great question. So we, we want, again, we want to go to the, the source, right? So if we want to understand how many colleges and universities in, in this country alone that are either test optional or test blind, you want to go to fairtest.org. This is their business. So as of today, I look for you all, 1,820 plus colleges and universities out of the 2,213 four-year colleges and universities. That's more than 82%, right? Currently, of all these four-year schools that are either test optional or test blind. Test optional means optional. <laughs> I, I've been doing talks, you guys, the last year and a half about, <laughs> is it really test optional, Gil? Is yeah. it really test? Yes, it's test optional, yeah. you know? But no, but really. It, really, yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> and, and even, you know, some schools are going to be clear. If they have a merit scholarship program, they're going to let you know then you have to submit your test scores. If your sons and daughters are thinking about the service academies, then they're going to want those test scores. But by and large, if a school tells you they're test optional, they're test optional. But that said, you know, there's, there's the strategy piece in terms of, you know, we depended on our children's school, my daughter, excuse me, because she went through that process, right? In terms of, okay, what would be a competitive score for X, Y, and Z school, right? And to, to be honest with you, thank goodness her counselor knew because she had that information. And a quick, a quick hint for all of us is that here's the middle 50% band of scores at all these schools that they will extend in terms of the admitted applicant pool if they're being transparent because Richmond were transparent. 
it'll let you know that if you're in the middle of 50% ban of these scores, right, then you have a decision to make to, to submit your test scores or not. But if your test scores are above the middle 50%, then I think it could help you. What if it's on the other end? Well, you know the answer to that, right, folks? Right? And lo and behold, guess what? Test scores went up at all these schools that were test optional last year and again this year because guess who submitted? Those students with higher scores. But we also know that there are students who withheld scores that probably may not have gotten in had they turned in their scores. But guess what? These are just scores. They're one thing out of eight other things we're looking for. The highly selective school is, schools in this country, we engage in what we call a, a holistic application review process. And that means then, we're not just interested in test scores. In fact, we're gonna be more interested in how did you perform during your four years at your secondary school? How did you push yourselves at your secondary school? We will never expect that you've taken all the honors, AP, IB, blah, 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 but we wanna see some particularly in the areas that you've excelled in, in the areas you're thinking about studying. So if you have a budding engineer, and all of a sudden, they haven't taken you know, a higher level math, chemistry, or maybe physics, hmm, right? Or maybe a budding writer, well then we wanna see that AP English on that transcript. But again, we're looking at essays. What do you have to say about yourself, right? right? It, put, it, it actually brings to life. You know, a, a lot of the different, you know, disparate pieces of paper on your application. Well, we're gonna ask, are you gonna be a good roommate? Recommendations are gonna be important, right? Will you uphold the honor code? So there's a whole host of things, and the last thing I'm gonna bring up is this, institutional goals or priorities. There are so many schools out there, and we're all different. We all have different missions. We're all looking for different things. So now you're thinking, uh-oh, how would we know? How would my son or daughter know? Well, you have these two, lucky you all. And then here's a top tip for you. In the search boxes, type in strategic plan. Look at the most recent one. If it's a good one, and <laughs> they will all have information on enrollment about the kind of students they want. So that will give you an idea in terms of the priority for some of these schools. And I would also add, Anthony and I did a um, self-study within, within our own office with, with test optional uh, programs, and we figured out that of the roughly 150 colleges and universities that 98% of web kids traditionally apply to, um, only 17 of them were places that may, would, would, would likely like to see some kind of test score. Um, Everyone else was, was either test blind, they don't want them at all, like the University of California does not want them at all, or test optional. We also did a study to look at last year's class and who submitted scores and who didn't submit scores, and was there any weird patterns there? In other words, if our top quarter of our test takers submitted scores, our average SAT last year was about a 1520, by the way. It gives you an idea. Okay, everyone had a 1500 or better if they submitted their scores, um, or a 34 or higher on the ACT. Uh, and that group was admitted the same level as the kids who didn't submit scores mm -hmm. to the same institutions. Okay, so it wasn't that those that had the highest scores got in faster to certain colleges than those who didn't submit scores to those same, you know, super, super um, top tier colleges. Uh, so there was no way for us to, to look at it and say, oh, it's better if you send scores than if you don't send scores. It was very, very even, uh, and it gave us real, a real sense that colleges, Gil and his staff at, at, at places like Richmond and, and other highly selective colleges, were really telling us the truth when they said, you know, that's not going to be part of the evaluation if it's not in the file. Uh, and it's not going to hurt a student if they don't submit those scores. Uh, so that, that was really important to, to, for us because it's how we're advising the junior class right now. Th that's actually interesting because I think that also speaks to the reputation Webb has. Because the fact that 
non-submitters are still getting in at the same rate yeah. at all these schools. That tells you something, right? And that was a lot of the academic right? program and, the, mm -hmm. and the, the feedback we got from the most selective colleges about the importance of our academic program at Webb um, as being a, a big driving part of the biggest part of, of making that decision. Um, but you know that's that's a conversation we have all the time with, with with folks like you, where we present our students and we say you know every class at Web is important. We don't have any fluff courses. We don't have anything easy at Web. Um, I can't think of a course that doesn't require thinking and 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 you know really really uh, important am amount of time to be spent in them. Whether it's a regular level course or an advanced studies or an AP level. Um, and thankfully, you know, it, it is a school that has a hundred year reputation of, of uh, having a really strong, rigorous program. So it, it has helped us a lot. One little tidbit, it was really interesting. We did a self-study too, and we learned that we actually had students who were part of our incoming class this year that did, that did not submit test scores, and their test scores were actually up in the top 25%, right? ended up being top 25% when we surveyed them. It's really interesting how they withheld scores, right? And because they're really high. And we're trying to think what, what, what motivated them not to do that. It's kind of interesting. Well, uh, thank you, Hector and Gil. I thought maybe we could open it up to the parents if you guys have maybe a, a, a question or two. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the big driving reason why colleges were going optional was because many students couldn't take those exams, right? That you couldn't access those test centers or they were being canceled at the last minute, which was happening here in, in the Inland Empire, you know, left and right, um, let alone our international population in their countries where tests were not even existent. So I'd say I think about half our students had submissible scores that were used. I think about 65% of the students took a test of some sort, either an ACT or an ACT, uh, but about half of them uh, chose to, to submit. Um, but it was all driven by the, the, you know, by COVID, by the pandemic, uh, and most of the reasoning behind that, that they didn't submit scores was because they couldn't even take the tests, you know, and, um, you know, we're, we're a place like Webb is not a typical high school, right? A typical high school, do you guys understand what the average SAT in America is? Do you know what the average SAT in the United States is? 1,020, okay? Somebody got something higher than that, it looks like. So <laughs> 1,020, the average SAT at Webb, non-pandemic time, okay, before, before COVID, was about a 1,380 almost a 1400. That is not typical. Okay, that, that, that's very, very few schools, about maybe less than 2% of the high schools in the United States could claim to have SAT averages of, of, that, of that level. Um, so our kids do well on those kinds of exams, so they're not shy to take them. Um, but what we keep hearing over and over and over from our college friends on, on the college admissions side them saying to us, there better be something more impressive than those scores in that application if we're going to admit that kid. So if your best thing about you was your perfect SAT score, you're not gonna get in to lots of places. That's not going to wow anybody. But if you did amazing work beyond those scores, then perhaps that will be much more important to the, to the picture and to the, the story you tell. And now with most kids not submitting scores, um, that's definitely true. It's your story, it's who, what you say in your essays, it's what's written in the recommendation letters, it's the caliber of the program that you're following at the high school and the kind of high school you attend. All of those are things that are serving our students really, really well with or without test scores. All right, well then, thank you, Gil. Just, just oh, one more. Right all right. <laughs>
So what a great question. The question is, what advice do we have for children to do in the summertime? And I'm not trying to be a smart aleck or facetious here. Rest is important. <laughs> Sleep is important, right? They, we, they just went through a very rigorous, tough year, and you want to afford them the time to kind of rest their minds a little bit, right? But having said that, there's so many things that your young people should do because they want to do them. Not because they feel like they have to pad up, right, a resume, an activity sheet. Because frankly, there are moments where all of a sudden, oh, here's someone who went to Costa Rica for a week, right? Okay, was that because you were doing good work? Were you passionate? Or because you were padding up your resume because you were in Costa Rica and you really didn't do anything else outside of doing some basic kind of volunteer work. Maybe it's a function of your ability to pay the cost of going to that program, right? So because you're coming from that privileged background. So if you are gonna do those kind of things for your sons and daughters, then let's make sure that they're doing things that they really wish to do and they're making good impact. It's not just because, oh, this is gonna be good for college, right? Because colleges, we, we love the fact, and I'm, I don't wanna speak for every college, I love the fact when young people have jobs in the summertime. Where, where is that now? It makes me crazy, <laughs> you know? I mean, I, I had two jobs, <laughs> you know, come yeah. on. So it, it's okay to have a job, you know? It, it doesn't have to be the internship, right? At Morgan Stanley, by the way. <laughs> you know, some of you are like thinking, oh, that'd be a great job, right? But that is impressive, don't get me wrong, but still. You know, there, it should be stuff that they really want to do. And some of your children, like my, my son and daughter, you know, they, they wanted to kind of get ahead and good for them. They actually took a class in the summertime so, so, uh, so that their fall, because my son with hoops and lacrosse, he wanted his spring to be a little bit lighter. So he took a class so that in the spring, he didn't have to take six classes, he took five. My daughter in the, in the opposite end on the fall, she took one in the summer so that she only had five classes. So it kind of helped actually. Yeah, and, and the job thing is a big deal and we, we, we recommend that in, in college guidance here at Webb all the time. Um, you know, and some kids, you know, I think it was last year I walked into Chipotle down the hill and there was a Webb kid behind the counter. I almost had a heart attack, I couldn't believe it. Like I never see a Webb kid have a real job. It's, it, it's, what's that? He wasn't eating, he was serving. <laughs> he was serving behind the counter. And you know, we tell the kids all the time, I told my own kids, get a job. Did they? No. <laughs> okay, they did not. One time we were driving down Town Avenue and there was this guy on the corner of Town and Foothill with a spin sign. You guys have probably seen him. And I said to, either Will or Ben, I can't remember who I said it to, but one of them, I said, look at that guy. Like, I wonder how he got that job, and I wonder what kind of story he has to tell about that job. Like, would you ever do that? And my kid looked at me like, no. And I said, but think of your college, you could write your college essay on that experience. It would be incredible get a job on the corner of town and foothill, spinning that sign and you got a winning college essay. And I thought, plant the seed, see what happens. Never, nothing. <laughs> they never got a job in anything, right? They were always looking for a job and hoping they didn't find one. You know? and, and I think in privileged communities like Webb, there is a tendency to have them go do things that look impressive, sound impressive, and cost ridiculous amounts of money, right? Like, don't send your kid to an $8,000 summer program somewhere. Um, it doesn't impress any college that I've ever met. Um, unless they're doing something really, really interesting and unique to their passion and they love it, right? If they're doing it, and it costs a bunch of money, as long as they're doing it for really good reasons and they really love it and they get to say something about it and, and, and you know, share it with, it with their college uh, application, then terrific, but many times I see the kids who have padded their, their little summer 
uh, programs with all sorts of things, and most of them are just things that either cost a lot of money or look very typical of what prep school kids do who go to privileged places like, like private schools like Webb, um, and seldom do I see simple things like a kid who just works at Chipotle. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely, a job is, is a big deal. All right. Uh, we'll take one more question. <laughs> one more question. So first source. So your question is, what would be like the top three things that colleges and universities look for when they're looking to admit students, right? When they're reviewing applications and which factors are the most important. So according to national surveys, and deans like myself, we're surveyed all the time, right? We're like the original survey monkeys, right? So <laughs> they will ask us, how would you, you rate X factor, blah, 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 and level of importance and so on. And in the last three decades, it hasn't changed. Number one, right, would be really quality of courses taken, and number two, performance, i.e. grades. What you don't see is that a lot of schools like Richmond will factor in quality of courses taken within the context of the secondary school. Again, we're looking at your sons and daughters Right, within the context of one of the best boarding schools anywhere. So again, but we don't expect that they've taken all of them, but we want to see some, right? So transcripts has not changed, right? Test scores we know has changed, but we also will want to know, because most of us are residential, what else are you gonna do here? How will you add to this community? We don't want to be the most boring school in America, right? <laughs> so now I'm gonna look into what you two do in and out of the classroom, and I'm gonna hope it's all legal, right? <laughs> That's gonna be important, and we're just trying to look for impact. I'm, you don't have to be the founder of the sewing team, the president of the sewing team. You don't have to be the captain of the sewing team, but as part of the sewing team, you made an impact to this community because somehow, some way, you did a project that helped all these homeless people, right, be warmer at night. That is the kind of stuff that resonates. So basically, that, that piece right there, and the essays. I am giving you four now, sorry, four. <laughs> because there was a Harvard study that's never been replicated. It was in 2013, and these two researchers, right, Friedfeld and Voltaggio, want to know the most stressful part of the admission process. They sampled s seniors and first-year students, and guess what they found? the most stressful thing for young people are the essays because of the word P. I'm 52 and I still do it, right? When I have to do a report, I'm procrastinating, right? <laughs> essays become very stressful when you wait till the last minute. Great, thank you. Thank you, Hector. Thank you, thank Gil. You. <laughs> thank you, Gil. Thank you, Hector. Thank you for admitting me. I'm right, so we glad can I all admitted. thank Gil for in and out because it's his favorite. So I wanted You're to yeah. surprise awesome. you. But like I said, now people are going to be like, what's happening for the next affiliates meeting? And I don't have a special treat just yet. So. <laughs> well, you spoiled me, so thank you. I didn't think I was going to get in and out this trip. So thank you for all of this. Right. Um, and then I figured we would do one last thing kind of fun as a group is first thank our theater technical director, Alex Valdez, on top for helping all of that. And then if we could all actually stand up and wave at the camera, because the meeting's being recorded, so I want to give a special shout out to our families who are viewing the video. And you guys can't be here, but we miss you. <laughs> and we hope to see you on campus soon, and we hope you enjoy the recording. Um, so, you know, be careful as you walk to, you know, your cars. And